think we'll start. Uh, my name is Jim Turk. I'm the director of the Center for Free Expression, and the Center is very pleased to be sponsoring uh, today's event, um, which is about one of the most important issues facing all of us uh, in our contemporary society, even though the seriousness of it, I think, um, well, leads many of us to, to just feel it's all hopeless, there's nothing much to do. Um, I'm talking, of course, about privacy in the digital age. Um, and for any of you who are tweeting, I've put the hashtag at the bottom of the screen here, uh, hashtag protect yourself. Uh, we're heavy, we have two speakers today. Uh, one uh, by a, a cameo appearance by a pre-recorded, uh, uh, at a pre-recorded event, uh, Edward Snowden, who will be known to many of you and, and really is responsible more than anyone else for us being aware of the extent of government intrusion uh, into our lives. Um, our main speaker, uh, Edward Snowden is your warm-up act. <laughs> our main speaker is Laura Tribe, who's the digital rights specialist for Open Media, which is an organization uh, that works to keep the internet open, affordable, uh, and surveillance free, a formidable task. Um, she leads Open Media's campaigns and advocacy on digital privacy. Uh, she has a strong interest in empowering internet users to stand up for their rights online. She has a background in the intersection of uh, human rights and information communications technology. She says she loves the internet and is excited about fighting for what makes it great. She holds a BA in media information and technoculture from Western University, formerly known as the University of Western Ontario and is an MA in communications from Carleton. She was a key figure in the Canadian Journals for Free Expression before uh, moving on to uh, open media. And she's a member of the advisory board for the Center for Free Expression and one of the people I find most valuable to talk to of the many people I talk with. Uh, I also wanted to, before proceeding with uh, Edward Snowden's contribution, wanted to thank uh, uh, Ange Holmes, who's the coordinator for the center, and did all the work to actually make this possible today, and also Brian Bowes, who's doing the uh, video recording of this, and it will be uh, live streamed and, and available through RICAST. So let's proceed with Edward Snowden's comments on protecting yourself on the internet, with some advice he has to give. Um, so, <laughs> again, I, I, uh, I, I hardly touch uh, communications for anything that can be considered uh, sensitive just because it's risky, but the easiest way for the government, any government, uh, or any adversary, even criminal hackers, you know, even if you, if you love the government, you trust the government, you think the government can do no wrong, uh, remember that governments change. Remember that the politician that you, you think is so great today will not be the same one in four years, five years, ten years from now. And because you collect, your communications are being collected in bulk today, regardless of whether or not you're uh, suspected of any criminal activity, but just as a matter of course, because that's the policy, um, when this is happening, these are caught as they transit internet service providers. These communications are caught as they trans, uh, basically are transmitted on the lines that are owned by people who are not you, that are not the government. Uh, telecommunications providers, internet service providers. Uh, it's these sort of transit interceptions that are the cheapest, the easiest, and they scale the best. So what you need to do is you need to ensure that your communications are protected in transit. Uh, and these are tools that are called end-to-end -end encryption tools. It means the computer here and the computer here at point A and point B are the only ones who have access to that communication. It's not stored unencrypted at Dropbox. You know, Dropbox is hostile to privacy. Uh, it's stored at a, uh, a Dropbox alternative, like a company called Spider Oak, uh, where Spider Oak doesn't have the encryption key uh, to see what you've uploaded to them. They've removed sort of that ability from themselves as part of their business model. 
um, because it makes it much easier for them to comply with regulatory framework. And you don't have to worry about them selling your information to third parties. You don't have to worry about them providing that information to governments. Uh, so you can go and, and basically work with privacy-friendly providers, or um, you can integrate this. This is becoming uh, much easier. This used to be kind of a, a very difficult thing. But now we have free, easy-to-use tools that you can download on your smartphone right now while you're sitting in the room if, if you have a smartphone. For the iPhone, there's a, uh, a program called Signal uh, by Open Whisper Systems that's very good. Uh, I know the, the security model there. Um, you know, I wouldn't trust your life. Any of these things, they don't protect you from metadata association, but they do strongly protect your content from precisely this kind of in-transit interception. Um, and you can download that on the iPhone. For the Android phone, um, there are two programs. One's called Red Phone. Uh, the other is called Text Secure that provide the same capabilities in two different packages. And I think they're actually cross-compatible as well. Uh, and the idea is, even if you're not doing anything that needs to be protected, uh, you know, even if you're just calling your mother, your grandmother, if you want to say hi, just want to say I was thinking about you, um, the more you do this, the more you get your friends, your family, your associates to adopt these free and easy to use technologies, the less stigma is associated to people who are using encrypted communications, uh, who really do need them to rely on them. Uh, sensitive sources trying to communicate with journalists in your country and in other countries, in Egypt, you know, uh, where these people end up in, in jail, uh, they don't get fair trials. Um, for basic political activism, for basic reporting. Um, you know, what might get somebody thrown in jail for life in the West will just get a bullet in the back of the head and back alley in some of these other countries. And the more ordinary people use these same technologies, these same methods of communication, uh, the more of sort of a cloud it provides, a protection it provides for everybody else who needs to rely on these technologies. We're creating a kind of herd immunity that helps protect everybody everywhere. But ultimately, it's going to come down to we can develop uh, and use new technologies that enforce our rights on a technical level, but we can't sort of abdicate our involvement with politics. We have to call uh, politicians on the fact when they facts when they make these extraordinary claims about you know this is going to keep us safe from terrorism, which we know is not fact. And the Charlie Hebdo attacks, for example, mass surveillance didn't help. Uh, France already had mass surveillance. They knew who the individuals were that uh, were involved in the attack. Um, and even though they had, through traditional lawful means, uh, you know, that have existed for 50 years to target these people uh, for surveillance, they didn't because the resources that could have been applied to that had been applied to mass surveillance programs instead. The same thing in the Australian incident. They had gotten, I think, 18 calls about this particular individual within the course of three days, saying, hey, this guy is crazy. You, you might want to go take a look at your files, look at your police records, and, and see if you should watch what this guy's doing. Uh, he's involved in some kind of extremism. Um, and yet, despite all of the mass surveillance that happens in Australia, we know they use the same X key score mass surveillance tool that's uh, developed by the National Security Agency. Didn't help them there. Uh, you know, it's the same thing in Denmark. It's the same thing in Canada. Mass surveillance simply does not stop attacks. We know that. We have uh, you know, a decade-long record of that. Um, we have to say that's not the case. Uh, if it is the case, please present evidence, make it public, and make us understand why you're, you're doing this. And ultimately, even if it is the case, even if mass surveillance is efficient, even if mass surveillance is effective, even if the bulk collection of the private records of all of our lives, you know, all of our private associations, who we talk to, who we travel with, who our cell phone, you know, uh, lies next to overnight, you know, which indicates our lovers and things like that. Um, all of the purchases we make, even if this did lead to a society where there was no crime at all, where nobody could dare break the law, is that the kind of world we want to live in? Sometimes violations of law lead to positive ends. Uh, you know, um, Revolutions uh, around the world are, by their very nature, unlawful, but sometimes they lead to good outcomes. Uh, every social movement that uh, has, has advocated against a law that is on the books, but vile, but terrible, 
uh, any historical wrong, involves some measure of lawbreaking. And if we provide the government, if we provide politicians with the, not just the social authority to put anything on the books that they want, but also the technical capability to enforce that perfectly uh, all the time, I think that means something very profound for the future of Western society. We need to think about if that's really what we want to embrace. Thank you. issues and I'll turn it over to Laura. Thanks. Is the mic working okay? You good? Uh, and you'll be available to answer questions afterwards. Oh, don't you worry. Yeah. I will answer questions. That is, that is the point of today. Um, thank you to Jim and Ange and Brian and the Center for Free Expression at Ryerson here for, um, this is one of a number of great events that have been taking place here and it's, it's nice to be able to talk to you guys today about this. Um, First of all, Jim gave me a very nice introduction, but I think it's important to point out um, who I am. I am not a computer scientist. I'm not a programmer. I don't understand encryption to the extent that Edward Snowden does. I can't analyze software and tell you what's gonna keep you safe and what's not. Uh, what I am is an activist. Um, I'm an advocate. I am very invested in the internet and the future of the internet and what it looks like. And so I come to this from having tried to learn this myself, spoken with people who are experts, uh, and really tried to do my best to protect myself online. So I might not have all the answers to all of your questions, uh, but hopefully this can make it a little bit more accessible because I find that a lot of times when we start to talk about uh, digital rights online, it can get scary. Uh, privacy and mass surveillance. Uh, Edward Snowden presents this really grim world with all these revelations that he shared, but I also think that there's a lot of hope there. So uh, the activist in me is here to try and uh, bring you guys along for the ride and make us all feel a little bit safer online throughout this. So I just want to do a quick sort of survey of who is here and what everyone is hoping to get out of today. So who here is actually a journalism student at Ryerson? Okay, who is staff or faculty at Ryerson? Who has nothing to do with Ryerson and is just here because they're worried about the internet and staying secure? Who has not raised their hand yet? <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> Okay, cool. Um, and is there anything in particular that you want to be able to leave here today knowing how to do online? Anything? Well, then you're going to get something and you're already going to come out ahead of your expectations, so that's good. Uh, so just a rough uh, overview of what we're going to try and go through today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the first is why privacy matters. And you're here today, obviously, because you have the slightest interest in your digital privacy. But I think it's important to remember that there are things we can do to protect ourselves online, that it's worth fighting for and not everything is lost. And I think that there is some hope left in what uh, digital privacy can look like online and should look like online. And hopefully this will leave you feeling a little bit more empowered at the end of today. Um, we're gonna give you a few things that you can do to actually increase your own digital privacy. Uh, they should be pretty easy and accessible and we're actually gonna try them out. So uh, we have a Wi-Fi connection if anyone brought their phones or their laptops and we're gonna give you the chance to actually try and put some of these tools to use to see how easy or complicated they are and actually leave with a few tools in hand. But first, I have to address the notion <laughs> that if I have nothing to hide, I have nothing to fear. Who here has heard this sentence before? Who here has said this sentence before? I've said it long before I became a digital rights advocate. I was like, well, I did nothing wrong, I have nothing to hide. Um, and I think this is the underlying problem with the framing of digital privacy right now, is the idea that we're still trying to prove that I have nothing to hide. That it is on me as an individual to prove that I am innocent and therefore should not have to worry about protecting my privacy. I have three arguments, these are my arguments, they are not everyone's, but three arguments against this notion that I have nothing to hide so I have nothing to fear. The first one is that it's crap. It's a total lie and everyone has something to hide. I have lots to hide, you have lots to hide. I don't know some of you, you probably don't want me knowing everything about you. You of course have things to hide, that's the idea of being an individual person. Uh, it's the reason that we have 
walls in our houses, we have locks on our doors, we close the bathroom door when we go to the bathroom. It's the reason we have passwords on our email. Uh, I think that Glenn Greenwald said it really well when some of the Snowden revelations started coming out, which is where he said, like, oh, if you have nothing to hide, give me the password to your email. And I think it goes a lot farther than that. It's the password to Facebook. It's the password to your Twitter account, to your computer, to your phone. It's all of the conversations you've had that you might think have nothing to do with the government and they might not be worried about, but would you tell your parents or your kids or your friends or your employer? And so when you start to think about what are you hiding and who are you hiding it from, everyone has something to hide. Uh, the second point is my personal pet peeve, which is I don't care if I have nothing to hide, it's just no one's damn business. It is mine, I have a right to privacy. It's uh, it included in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's in our charter, <coughs> excuse me, and I just have a right to it. I don't have to justify it. But the third piece is where I think really when we get into this digital information age that we're living in, it becomes really, really clear which is even if you don't have anything to hide, even if you're fine putting it all out there and you are comfortable with everything you've done, that it is legal, that you stand behind it, that you don't care who knows it, you are assuming that what people see in that data is the same thing that you see in that data. So that can be misinterpreted in different ways. You could lend your phone to someone, lend your computer to someone, and they look up something online that is totally harmless. You could look up something that's a suicide prevention hotline just because you're curious what exists. You might be worried about a friend, but all of a sudden the government has seen that you looked up a suicide prevention hotline and maybe they think you called it. Or maybe your employer finds out that you've been looking up therapy and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with it. But maybe the stigma has something to do with your job. And so even if you don't think there's anything wrong with what you've done, it can be legal, it can be socially acceptable, in different contexts it can be interpreted in different ways. So I think it's really important to remember that you're not always seeing the same things in your information that other people might see. In addition to that, when we look at things like government surveillance, you know, we're really trusting the government to handle this information in the right way. So we have a new government, Trudeau seems to be riding this honeymoon out, people think he's great, open, transparency, accountability, that's awesome. Maybe we trust him with all of the new powers invested in him with Bill C-51 and we think he will use those for good. But we also share our information with other governments. So if President Trump in the US becomes a reality, do we trust him with our information in the same way? If we get a new government in Canada after Trudeau that uses that information for different powers, do we really trust the future that can come with that? So remembering that this information can be stored, it can be used against us now and later, and not necessarily because we've done anything wrong. So that sounds grim, and I don't mean to make it really depressing, but I think it's important to remember that we have to actually hold <laughs> governments and those that have that information accountable, um, and that's a really big piece of this. So step one, what are you actually trying to keep private? Is there anything here in particular people would like to be able to keep private by the end of today? Yeah. Yeah, banking information, for sure. And banks go to a lot of trouble to try and make sure that your information stays safe online. What else? Just banking. Yeah. Community Absolutely, your communications. So. There's sort of two sides of the things that we try and keep private online. The actual communications we have, so the conversations that I might have with you, uh, texting you saying, hey, what are you doing tonight? I'm gonna be here at this time. And then the metadata, which is a term that I think Snowden has really helped to popularize, uh, which is sort of the information about that communication. So where I sent it from, uh, when I sent it, how long our phone calls lasted, all of those pieces of the puzzle that can tell us a lot about our communications. And so there's two different ways and two different things we need to look at when we're talking about protecting our privacy online. Um, a lot of the tools that Edward Snowden recommended in that video uh, protect your communications, the content of it. So when I'm texting someone, I can use Signal to try and keep the contents of that secure. But the metadata around it, from when I send it, where I send it, and to whom, can still be seen. So it's important to know what information you're putting out there to be able to know what to protect. The second piece, is what are you actually trying to protect your information from? Or who are you trying to protect it from? Sorry, I couldn't help with the more you know slide in because it just reminds me of like cheesy childhood PSAs. Um, and I put four different pieces up here. There's probably lots more that you want to protect your information from. Uh, the first one is government surveillance. And at Open Media, we are a community-based organization. We really focus on uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, making sure that people feel empowered to speak up, to 
uh, hold their government accountable to actually have the democracy that we want to have. So when we're looking at digital rights, most of our focus is on government surveillance because the government works for us. They're supposed to be working for us. And so we want to make sure that that's actually happening. Um, the second piece, corporate data collection. If you want to know about corporate data collection and why it's a problem, talk to this guy because I have never met anyone that hates corporate data collection as much as Jim. So he will talk about it for ages with you afterwards. Um, and that's things like Facebook and Google, tracking your data, your search history, all of those pieces. Uh, the third piece is from criminals. So, uh, you know, people that are trying to get access to your banking information, people that are trying to use your account login info, they hack all kinds of different uh, tools and technologies to try and get access to personal information and generally for financial gain. Um, it's the reason that lawyers try and have secure conversations, that a lot of them will have in-person meetings now. They will talk to you over the phone if they can, as opposed to email, or they would prefer in person. Um, and the last one I put up here from your friends. Friends might be an air quotes kind of word. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be that you think your best friend is going to be stealing all of your Facebook information if you leave your phone open. But it's that sort of physical barrier of people that are actually sitting next to your phone or your computer, and can they gain access to it? So a few things as we go through this. Um, some of these tools are really easy, and some of them are a little bit more complicated. Um, I know a few of you have gone through these steps with me before for getting uh, PGP email set up and trying to secure your email communications versus something as basic as text messaging. And some are easy, and some are hard. Um, as we go through this today, ask me questions. We'll try and figure it out together. Um, and if not, I'll, I'll try and find you the answers. So I will promise to try and take those with me. Um, but at the end of the day, it, there's a lot. And what I really hope that we can take away from this is that you have the ability to pick and choose what is the most important to you to prioritize it and choose what is of value to you. Um, these are some basic tools that we'll go through today. They are things you can do to help strip some of the information you leave online to protect some of your communications. But at the end of the day, there's only so much we can do. And I think that the video introduction was a really great piece for that, which emphasizes that it's not up to us. Uh, I can protect myself, but my, my efforts to protect my online communications are only as strong as the weakest link with who I'm speaking with, who I'm speaking for or about, uh, and the digital, digital surveillance mechanisms that are in place. So if the government has mass surveillance in place, I can do my best to encrypt my, my communications. I can do my best to secure those communications, and I can try and make sure that the people that I call and I email are using encryption and all the most secure tools, but at the end of the day, it's up to decision makers like government and corporations to actually respect my privacy as well. And so these are small things we can do to start to feel a little bit more empowered, to take a little bit of that control back. But it's not to say that it's on every individual to protect ourselves all the time. I think we really do need to have that larger pressure from the community to ensure that our governments and companies that are uh, working with them are protecting our privacy. OK. Everyone here has a cell phone on them, don't they? Hold it up. It's a little experiment. We're going to do it. OK. If you do not have a password on your phone, <laughs> keep holding your phone up. Every single person in here has a password on their cell phone. Yes. See, it does work. Sometimes it actually happens. I've been in classrooms before where you know half the class will still leave their hand up, like, no, I don't have a password. It's fine. What's the big deal? Uh, and it's sort of a good gauge of where we're starting from. So. Seven things we're going to go through. Passwords. You've all passed the first test, which is great. Um, protecting some of the things on your cell phones, your emails, uh, some of your internet browsing. And we'll take some questions and actually try and get into putting some of these tools to work. Passwords is the part everyone hates. It is hard. It is complicated. And basically, the more complicated your password is, the more secure you are, which always feels like you're building a barrier from yourself accessing your own content as opposed to other people accessing your own content. But I really can't emphasize these two things. One, when you're making passwords, the longer your password is, the better. It can be a full sentence. It is still better than really short gibberish because these are computers that are trying to just run algorithms to break into your password. So that is the first piece of advice. When you are making new passwords, make them longer. The second one is do not use them in multiple places. How many people here, raise your hands and be honest, use the same password in more than one account. Yeah, because they're annoying. They're a total pain. They're hard to remember. They're hard to keep track of. Uh, so this is how secure the word password is as a password. <laughs> a computer, a regular desktop computer, this laptop, will pretty much guess your password 
instantly. Not a surprise, it's one of the top 10 most used passwords and also if there is one thing you know about making passwords, it should probably not be password. <laughs> if you take something like Bananagrams, which has letters, characters, it's 11 characters long, it's a little bit longer, it will take a regular laptop four years to try and break that. So just making it three characters longer has already helped and not using the word password, which is the most generic. Uh, and part of the reason that you know, I think that's important to note, first of all, four years, that seems like a really long time. You should change your password before four years are up. Um, that's under the assumption that it is a desktop computer trying to crack your password. So bear in mind that anyone that's really trying to hack passwords is probably using something a little bit more powerful than this. But that's a big difference in just adding three characters on the end. Now you take something like this, which is total gibberish. It's 22 characters long, and it will take 137 quadrillion years to crack. I don't know what 137 quadrillion years is. I know that I will have died and changed my password before now and then, um, probably more than once, but that's impossible to remember. Like, I just will not remember that password ever. So there are some different things you can use to try and remember your passwords. Um, everyone's got their own strategies and plans and devices and acronyms and different tips to do it. Um, first, do not store it in a spreadsheet on your computer or in some sort of Word document on your computer. That sounds basic, but it's just as easy for them to get them, whoever the ominous them is that's trying to get your password, uh, if it's stored on your computer. So that's a, that's a basic thing. Um, one of the tools which Jim and I will argue about is a password manager. So Jim has crazy mnemonic devices to try and remember his passwords, which I respect and I just I can't do it. Um, so different password managers. KeePass is an open source one that um, is generally been recommended to me by uh, some people that are working in sort of the activism community trying to make sure the passwords are kept safe. And it will generate gibberish for you and remember it. So the only thing you need to remember is your one password to open your password manager. There's a number of other ones. Um, the one thing I would say is that when you're picking different tools, uh, ones that live in the cloud up in space are up for attack, basically. Uh, you don't have the guarantees that they're being protected. So things that actually hold the information on your computer are better than things that are holding it up in the cloud, as a general rule. Um, how secure is my password.net is the site that I use to get those different things. So I would not recommend putting your actual password in it because although they're not tracking your password, just typing your password into non-secure places online is a frowned upon practice because you never know who's tracking what. But it is a good way to go through and get a sense of if I add one more character on the end, how much does that actually add to the security of my password? And it's a cool site to play around with and you can try and think of some crazy long sentences and see what you can do with it. So I'd recommend checking it out. Any questions about passwords? Yes, Taryn. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There are entities trying to crack all of the password management. There are. This is where it starts to get ominous. Like these are small things and bits and pieces you can do to try and take back some of that control. Uh, one of the biggest ways that passwords get compromised and when you hear of these like massive hacks is that it get the list of one thing. So let's say LinkedIn is compromised and their password and login is taken and, and they use it. When you use the same password across multiple accounts, it's not necessarily that Gmail's hacked, it's that you use the same login from LinkedIn and Gmail. And so all of those passwords are used elsewhere. So generally, when people are trying to hack these massive lists or they're trying to compromise these big services that have all these passwords, so when you hear about like Sony and PlayStation and some of those things, uh, it's that they try and get this massive list and then just run all of those password and email login combinations against other sites. So that's the biggest reason that you want to have different passwords. Um, password managers can be tracked. There are keystroke loggers that can be downloaded as viruses on different people's computers to get those. There's, there's all kinds of ways that nothing will secure them forever and ever and ever. Um, we need to get into a much more intense computer programming land for that to happen. But yes, they can be cracked, they can be hacked in the same way that the rest of them can. Um, but having them in different places helps that a little bit. Does that help without being too grim? Okay. Yeah. I just want to make one comment. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was just going to say about the length of the password. Not only that, but uh, you should also look for how many bit encryption you're using mm -hmm. because there's different levels. Like there's a difference between 128 bit encryption and 256 bit encryption. So the higher it is, the more secure your encoding of your uh, yeah. digital password is going to be. And it's harder for someone to crack it. 
So yeah, that's absolutely. To consider, like, anyway. Okay. Your cell phones. They track you everywhere. They know everything about you. They hold all your deepest, darkest secrets. All of those good things about you. Um, there are a ton of things that you can do on your phone to mitigate some of the things that are being tracked about you. Um, if you have a cell phone and you like to use Google Maps, if you like to use Rocketman to know when the TTC is coming next, you will turn on location services. People will know someone, Apple, Samsung, whoever it is that has your, either your service provider, they will know where you are, they will track it, they can track you between cell phone towers. There are certain things that if you really want to keep private, leave your phone at home, sure. But there are a number of things you can do on your phone that will help cover up a little bit of the things you're doing and retain a little bit of that privacy. The first thing is text messages. And I'm talking SMS text messages. So between like an iPhone and an Android or not WhatsApp, not iMessage, nothing that uses data, but actual like text messages um, are, as has been described to me, the most insecure means of communication. So the way it was explained to me how SMS works, this is not my own definition, is that it is like me standing in a room trying to talk to Jim, who's in the back corner, and I just yell Jim's name really loud. And then Jim yells back going, yeah, it's me, what do you want? And everyone else in the room can hear what's going on in the meantime. And anything that's listening can hear it that's within earshot. So whether that's other cell phone towers can hear it, other cell phones can hear it, or other digital listening tools that you know, law enforcement agencies or anyone else could be using to listen can hear. There is nothing protecting the contents of your communication. It's like yelling in a mall. So that's one basic thing that we can do to try and secure our communications is if you want to actually cover up the contents of what you're saying, SMS is not the way to do it. Um, it can't be encrypted. It's just yelling into a big, large room. And then changing your location services on your phone is another basic one, and we can go through a number of different ways to do that. Uh, so some different tools that we can try and we can get you guys set up with on your phone. Um, location services on a basic level if you go through and if you have not changed this and you've granted access to every phone that has ever, or pardon me, every app that has ever asked for access to these things, uh, you might be surprised how many apps are actually tracking your location at all times. Um, it's the same thing for how many have access to your contacts and how many have access to your photos and all of those different things. And just turning that off and being really selective about who you give that access to is a really basic starting point that can make a big difference. Um, turn on passwords. You all have passwords on your phone, which is great. And depending on the different apps that you use, you can actually turn on passwords for those as well. So you can protect the contents of different apps if they have that functionality. Um, I wish more of them had it, so I could just choose if I lent my phone to someone. I didn't give them access to every app I have possible, but that they only have access to the ones that are not locked. But I'll work on that. Um, Signal, which uh, Edward Snowden kindly mentioned in the introduction, is um, an encrypted text messaging app it's open source, it's made by Open Whisper. Um, it's Snowden approved, which feels like a pretty strong stamp of approval to me. Um, and it's also, he mentioned Tech Secure and Red Phone for Android. It's actually all one app now, so it's called Signal on every device. And it will load your contact list. Anyone that already has it will automatically show up. Um, I am slowly recruiting everyone on my phone to use Signal. It's impressive. I've collected quite a crew. Um, it's free. It's free, There's, it's, it works the same way that iMessage does. So this is one of the lowest barrier things you can do to text message people. Um, it has phone calls that go through data and the phone calls themselves are also encrypted. So it gives you that extra level of protection that yes, people watching, if they're looking at your usage, can actually tell that you're using Signal. If they are trying to follow your information, they can tell who you're texting and calling because they can tell who the recipient is. But the actual contents of your communication are encrypted. And as Snowden was saying, the more people that are using these technologies, the less that the people that really need it stick out. So you're protecting activists that are trying to organize events. You're protecting people that are in marginalized communities that are trying to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, trying to defend themselves or speak out. Uh, and it's really important for these to become normalized because this idea that I have nothing to hide where everyone goes, well, it's fine if they read my text messages. Like if you have something secret, encrypt it. 
well, if I only ever text my secrets encrypted and everything else is made public, it's pretty easy to know which text messages of mine to target. It's pretty easy to know when I'm saying something that I probably don't want the government to see because it's the only thing that I've encrypted. And so really normalizing these technologies makes a big difference in helping these to go a long way and to help other people who really need them to have them not stick out like a sore thumb. Uh, Wire is a, it's not super new, but it, it kind of got a lot of coverage in the last week or two, which is a new app uh, that's been released that does uh, video conferencing, it's all encrypted, end-to-end -end encryption. Um, it, it's proprietary, so it doesn't have the same um, external coder analysis to go through and really triple check that it's uh, as solid as Signal is. But if anyone here has used Slack or Google Hangouts, it's kind of this weird combination of the two. So it is probably the most user-friendly, uh, pretty thing you can draw on it, like Snapchat, you can upload pictures, it's integrated with Giphy, so you can send GIFs to your friends that are animated. It actually makes text messaging more fun, uh, and it's encrypted from end to end. has video chats, all those things. So uh, between those two, there's something that you can find that will actually make your communications more secure, and in some cases, actually more fun and pretty and higher quality. So something to keep in mind. Any questions about cell phone stuff? Yeah. Like one question. yeah. Um, too. Sure. Uh, you mentioned about tracking. Yep. So answer this one question. Why would Samsung be interested in That's tracking my challenge. location? Yep. Right? That's yep. one. And the other question is, how many physical people would they have to hire to analyze all that information? Okay, I have a two-part answer for you that might not answer everything, but I'll do my best. So why would Samsung be interested in tracking your information or Google? Uh, this is massive information. Massive amounts of information. Every bit of information these companies get is power. The more they know about, not just you, it's not you personally they're trying to track. They want to know what everyone's doing. They want to know when they combine everyone who's in this room and they can figure out that what something's happening. They can see the connections between people and what the similarities are. Uh, they can analyze patterns for traffic. For Google, like, it's not all malicious. It's just that it gives them the power to make better corporate decisions about what their business model is. Uh, when you're looking at the government, they definitely want to know where people are going, who they're hanging out with, so that if something happens, they have all of that information on file and can go back, and it also uses it for predictive technologies. Uh, so that's sort of the first piece. What they're doing with it, uh, or how many people they have to hire, I don't know, 137 quadrillion, however long it would take for the password, uh, that many people. It would take a lot of people to actually analyze every single person's data. So you have actually a robot really analyzing all this. But it's not people, exactly. They don't have people sitting there going, I wonder what you're doing today. It's, it's a lot of algorithms running across different platforms. And that's where I think some of the danger comes in, is that we see it as humans. We see our activities the way that humans see them. But when you start to compare them across computers running algorithms on it, it takes the context out of the picture, it takes the personal understanding of it out of the picture, the and it takes the humanity out of it. And all of a sudden we're just stripped down to locations, communications, patterns, and patterns that we don't even know exist might be seen in that information. Um, the other piece is that when these companies have this information, and this is something that we've seen uh, in the US with the Apple versus the FBI case, um, Law enforcement agencies want it as well. So even if the companies want it for their own purposes, them having it means that information exists for others to try and get later on. Uh, it's the same thing with cell phone companies that just have your, your call records uh, that will be trying to be accessed by the police and those kinds of things. So everyone wants your information because it makes them more powerful by having it, is the short answer. Yeah? Any chance we can get an encrypted version of the slide? <laughs> <laughs> the, slides are, the slides are being live streamed. They don't need to be encrypted. But yes, I'll make sure that Jim has them. And I was going to mention that at the end. I, I believe you have an email list that you're collecting emails for. So I'll make sure that Jim has all of the access to this. Oh, can I ask another question? Yes, absolutely. Oh, OK. Um, the situation with the Apple? But, yep. Um, you know all about that, right? Yes. <laughs> oh, Apple. The Apple versus the FBI? The incident, yes. Yep. Can you? Can I elaborate about it? Yes. Sure. I, I'll try not to get into it too much, and we can talk about the politics side of all of this at the end, because I can go on about that for days on end. Uh, but the very uh, 
very, very scaled down explanation of that case is in the US, um, there was an attack on San Bernardino in California and the iPhone of one of the attackers has that password protection where if you fail the password 10 times, it erases the phone. And so it's encrypted and the FBI can't access it. And what they're looking for is for Apple to, they've gone through the courts to try and get Apple to write software that will break its own encryption of the iPhone. And so the argument that's taking place in the US right now is should Apple be forced to break its own security mechanisms, to write code that breaks its own safeties and securities um, for law enforcement to be able to, to, be able to access this information. Um, there's a very strong argument for national security here, which obviously makes it clear that if this information is helpful in the investigation, that should be made available to the FBI. Uh, but the bigger picture and, and the bigger concern with that is that writing technology or writing code that will break their own security means that it can be used on every other iPhone. And so a lot of the times these privacy violations and, and ways of trying to break encryption or weaken the technologies we use to keep ourselves safe are used on a, well, in this case, it's really bad. But once that exists, what's to stop the police from using it in every other case, on every other cell phone? If they get a journalist who's trying to protect their sources and they won't reveal them, but the police have the ability to break the encryption on that phone anyway, what's stopping them? And so that's the debate that's taking place in the US right now that is really saying like these technologies are here for a reason. Um, and so that it's, I think it'll be a long time before we see the actual outcome of it, but it's been interesting to see how companies um, from across sort of the whole, all, all the big tech companies are really speaking up now saying that they're gonna strengthen their own encryption as well, knowing that these kinds of uh, requests and attacks from the government are coming. Does that help with context? Okay. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm cautious about giving all the information about it because I might get it wrong. I haven't brushed up on it in a little bit and it's been changing pretty quickly. Um, I believe that they do. Um, they have access to it from the telecoms as, in terms of the calls and that kind of thing. They're looking for the actual contents of the communications is my understanding of it. Um, and it also looks like when the law enforcement agencies had the phone, they tried to crack it themselves and like reset it already, so there's some extra pieces in the puzzle as to who's done what, when, and where that are factoring in as well. So, yeah. Uh, if I have my location for instance, just in my general setting, yep. on my phone, do, all the, do you apps still have access to them? No, so if you turn off location services in your phone, the apps don't have access to your location. Your cell phone provider does to some extent, because they have to be able to connect you to a cell phone tower. So it's not the same as like the instant GPS, but it will um, still know that you're in Toronto because you're connecting to Toronto cell phone towers and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and there's a lot of other ways that if you open Google Maps, for example, and have location services turned off, it will try and connect to the closest Wi-Fi network and it knows where that Wi-Fi network is, so it will ping you on the map, like generally close to that area, even if, as a way of being helpful. Um, so there's lots of things to be aware of in terms of like how Wi-Fi networks can still be used to get your location and those kinds of things. Uh, but yeah, if you turn it off, then the apps themselves don't have access to it. Is that good? Okay. Browsing the internet. This is the hardest one to protect because there are so many things in so many places and we all want to see everything. Um, there are sort of three things that we'll get into now and there's lots of other um, pieces that we can, we can touch on if people have questions. I'll do my best. Um, I do not promise that you will be able to browse completely anonymously by the end of this. Um, can I just interrupt you for a yeah. second? And just passing around a list. If any of you uh, want to share your email, we can let you know of future events, but also we could send you uh, uh, Laura's PowerPoint. So if you're interested in that, just uh, sign up on the sign-up sheet that's going to be coming around. Okay, great. Um, ads, trackers, and your general web traffic, what you do on the internet. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, when you look at ads, one, they're a pain. I usually find that ad blockers, like installing them on your, in your browsers and stuff like that, is actually the easiest thing to do to get people to protect their privacy online because you have this instant gratification of no more commercials when you're streaming things. Uh, you get all that extra crap on the outside of your web browser just like disappears and there's actual feeling of satisfaction. When we're looking at privacy tools, a lot of the time, the threat is intangible. Like we don't really know what we're protecting ourselves from. We can't really feel 
if we've been violated in any way. If someone breaks into your house, you know your privacy has been violated. If someone taps your cell phone, takes some of that information, if they've read your email, you don't really know that it's happened typically. And so it's hard to feel that threat. Um, when it comes to ads, it's like the gateway drug. As soon as you strip ads away, you go, wait a minute, there's a lot of crap coming through on here that I can block. Um, and so I find that's a nice way to actually, if you're looking for a tangible, like positive feeling of blocking some stuff, that's a good one to do. Um, news sites don't like it because that's how they're making all their money. Sorry, all the journalists in the room, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's super easy to do. Um, you can't block all of them, but there are a lot of plugins that will just help uh, block a bunch of those and, and strip the sites out. So how would people find those? Well, Where they're on the next slide, Jim. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about it. Um, there's a lot of things that will try and track your activity online, so between different sites. Uh, so ads are trying to track you because they want to know who you are, what you're doing. They're on news websites. They're, well, they're on every website, let's be realistic. Um, Google's probably the worst offender on this because they have ads everywhere on everything. And you might notice they're slightly more catered to your personal lifestyle or search history than you might like because they tracked all of your searches and then they gave you ads that correspond with it. Um, but that's one thing. Trackers are, uh, you'll frequently notice Facebook is a good uh, violator of this, bad violator of this as the case may be, uh, where even if you're not logged into Facebook, they're still tracking where you are. But if you are logged in, you'll go to websites and you'll see like, this many of your friends like the Globe and Mail. I don't know if the Globe and Mail does it, so I don't mean to throw them under the bus on that one. Uh, and they are tracking that it is you on this website and these are your friends that like it. And they're trying to connect the dots to have this picture of who likes what and where. And it builds to their own depth of information of how everyone connects and fits together. So that's another thing that we want to try and block. Um, and the third one is your actual web traffic. What you're doing online, what websites you're going to, what you're looking up, who you're talking to, and those pieces. So, some tools to try. Um, who here has heard of a VPN before? Who here uses a VPN? Nice. Sort of, sometimes. <laughs> um, there are a lot of them. Uh, a virtual private network is basically an encrypted way for you to connect to the internet. Uh, there are some you can pay for. Um, I have one that I use on my computer. It's called TunnelBear. It's really user-friendly, super easy, but you have to pay for it. Um, there are other ones uh, like Tor, which is, uh, has anyone heard of Tor? Yes? Okay. Is Telegram also good uh, Telegram is a text messaging app, isn't it? Unless I'm thinking of a different one. Yeah. So this is to actually secure your internet connection from your computer to the internet as you're connecting. And it builds an encrypted tunnel between you and the computers that you're trying to connect with. Uh, so that's a basic way to make sure that, you know, you're, if you're on public Wi-Fi, for example, Everything you're doing is public and people can see it. When you're using a VPN, it encrypts the connection between you and the public Wi-Fi and the computers you're trying to connect through so that everything you're doing isn't public to everyone else on the same network. I say this recognizing that I'm giving you a public Wi-Fi login at the end of this to try and actually install some of these if you need them, but that's why we're here. <laughs> and it also lets you even indicate what country you want to be seen as coming from. It does. Depending on the one you're using, it lets you pick what country you actually want to use the internet from. So. Uh, most commonly used by people trying to get US Netflix, I would say, is the easiest example in Canada, which is something I'll talk about at the end. Um, but in other countries where content is blocked, so if you're in Iran and you're trying to access content as an activist trying to organize, that content might be blocked in your country and it lets you choose other countries to access the internet from where that content isn't blocked and it's now available for you. Um, it's also a good way in countries where net neutrality is a problem. So let's say you're trying to stream video and your internet service provider says like, no, nah, we don't really like video, it takes up too much bandwidth. When you're using a VPN, they can't tell what types of content you're streaming. So it's a good way to make sure that your content isn't being treated differently for what it is that you're trying to access. So that's one tool I'd recommend. Um, and there's lots of them. We can talk about them afterwards if you guys have questions. Um, ad blockers and plugins, they're all very easy to access. You can just look them up um, and they take about 30 seconds to install. Ghostry is probably one of the best ones. Uh, which blocks trackers, and it's just things that are trying to track you. It automatically turns them off. If a website isn't working properly because they're turned off, you can actually, there's a drop down list that shows up and you can just turn on the ones that you need. So say you're trying to tweet something and the Twitter plugin is broken, you can just turn it back on and that will work as a plugin. Um, Privacy Badger is another one. It's made by the Electronic Frontier Foundation based out of San Francisco. Uh, similar idea, trackers, it does cookies. So it's trying to say like what websites are 
tracking you, what websites are actually trying to put all of these cookies on your computer to track what you're doing and where, and it turns them off if it thinks that it's actually trying to track you. If it doesn't think they're trying to track you, it just lets them run. Um, and it gives you that control to turn them on and off again as you need them. Um, Adblock Plus is one of a million different ad blockers you can install. Um, it's also free. All of these tools are free for the ad blockers and the plugins. Um, and there's lots of other ones you can look up. But these are three that I would say have streamlined my internet browsing experience and stripped a lot of the trackers out of the way. Just one quick yeah. Yep. I don't know if the library will let you install no, no, well, well, say, uh, plugins on their computers, but if it's your computer yeah. at the library, then yes. So it's a, just a download? Yep. It's just a really small plugin that gets attached to your web browser. So when you're going through browsing things online, it will automatically prevent those pieces from loading on your site. Oh, it's a straightforward download, and then it's just explode, and where it goes. Yep. OK. Can I, yeah. Does that make sense for library? Yeah. Okay. And just to add to that, if you're gonna like search in a library, yeah. uh, the best way to be secure in a library is to actually get a boot stick. A what? A boot stick. So you have like a USB with like 32 Remember gigabytes stick. on it, and then you can put like a Linux onto it, like a. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of all the different Linux programs that you could put on I'm it. I'm not a Linux pro. I'm not going to be able to. The name escapes me at the moment, but if you like search Linux and boot stick, you'll be able to like pretty much come up, find some tutorials on how to actually turn a little USB into its own little kind of computer, and then you can plug it in anywhere, and there's all, you have all the access you could ever need and all the security you could ever need as long as you put it on it. So. You guys can chat after. <laughs> um, the last thing I'll add is, uh, it's called DuckDuckGo, and it is Google, not made by Google. It is a search engine that does not track what you are searching, which for those of you that are tired of Google giving you ads for things that you didn't mean to look up or stupid things your friends looked up is kind of refreshing. You can search anything you want. It doesn't necessarily remember your search results to give you a more customized experience like Google does, so you sacrifice some of its memories that you're usually looking up that one Thai place that you can never remember the name of, but it will not remember what you're doing, which is nice to be able to go and have a secure place to search without Google tracking everything. Um, I think Google has a lot of great features, but I also think they know way too much about me and I don't always need to tell them more. So uh, that's one aspect of it. Um, and afterwards, we can also go through ways to, um, when you go into your settings in Google, you can actually turn off what they track, um, whether they remember your search history, whether they remember your YouTube playlist history and all those things. So there's a lot of ways to just turn off those features in the back end that will streamline that experience. Okay. Emails. Um, PGP email. Who here has PGP email? You're welcome. <laughs> I didn't do it for you, but good. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, so PGP stands for pretty good protection. And there are lots of different email providers that will provide encrypted email um, or encrypt parts of your email or secure parts of your email. PGP is a way to encrypt your email so that when I send something to Jim, the only person that can open it is Jim. And Jim needs to encrypt it to me for the only person to be able to open it to be me. It takes a little bit to set up. I'm happy to work with anyone who wants to try and set it up afterwards and get it going. Um, the thing to remember about this is this only works if the person you're sending your emails to also has PGP encryption. So this is a two-way street. This doesn't work that I can't just encrypt all my things and hope it's secure because I need to be able to send it to someone who knows how to decrypt it and they need to be able to encrypt it back to me. Otherwise, I'm just sending an email out that's gibberish that no one can read because they can't break it down, or it's completely open to everyone. Yeah? I agree with you. PGP is probably one of the best types of encryption, but I find it highly annoying, annoying that 98% of the world just doesn't know or care about it. Yeah. So it's useless if two people, parties are not involved with it. So PGP is probably one of the best ways to yeah, encrypt the actual contents of your email. When I'm sending something to Jim, anyone that intercepts it can see that I sent Jim an email, Jim responded, nothing that's inside of it can be read. So that's the great part about it. But you're right, it's first of all, not the most intuitive or easy to set up no. compared to some of the other apps or plugins. It takes probably 20 minutes to actually get going. Um, and it depends on other people having it. And so this is one of the tools that has some of the most power behind it, but also because it, of that is a little bit more clumsy to install and takes a little bit longer to get everyone else to adopt. So I'm happy to work with anyone who wants to try and get it set up. Uh, it's a great tool, but it definitely takes a little bit of time. I think one way they could fix it 
is if all these email providers would provide on-site encryption, but they don't. There's only one email service I know of that's free, and yeah. that's Proton Mail. There's, yep. two, there's actually two. Well, anyways, uh, two to note is the I other know. one. They're, they're both very good. Proton Mail, when you log in there, you have to use a special password to decrypt your emails. Why don't all free, mail, uh, free email providers provide that? Because they don't want your data protected. Because it's hard. Because they sell that data, as you're saying. There's, so. there's value in them having that information, but also it's another barrier of entry. Like You need to be invested in having that extra password and that extra layer. It slows it down a little bit. Um, and so until there is that demand, until we as citizens, as users, actually say, no, wait, this is what we want from a service. This is what we demand. This is the kind of communication that we are asking for. There isn't that motivation or incentive for companies to provide those services because they just don't see the demand from us. One other point is that like, if you use Gmail, for instance, when you delete your data on your email, apparently it stays on the server for a month after. Yeah, and depending on the services you yeah. use, you don't know how long so it stays there. It yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't, um, it doesn't really integrate well with Outlook. So if you're on a PC, Thunderbird is the best mail client to use. Uh, but it works with any mail client, or sorry, with any email provider, as long as you have a mail client on your computer. Um, so Thunderbird is the, the easiest one to integrate with it and the best one, but it works with Apple Mail um, as well and a number of other ones as we were trying to explore the other day, figuring out all the different possibilities. Uh, and then it works just like regular email. So you can encrypt some emails. If someone else doesn't have it, you can just continue to send regular emails. Um, that way, so yeah. So I mean, for the for, <laughs> I'm a techno peasant, um, and so uh, Laura's had to educate me about a few things. Um, so PGP works well when you're using an email client. In other words, you're not going online and using the web version of it. You're using, uh, and the one client doesn't work well with Outlook. Outlook, Microsoft doesn't cooperate. That's well, right. it does work well with, with Thunderbird, really yeah. well with Thunderbird, which is not the nicest email client, but not bad. It's not as pretty. That's all, um, but it's totally functional. The other option, and I don't know if you're going to talk about it, is, is the one you mentioned. There are beautiful email <coughs> providers, two of them, where they provide end-to-end -end encryption. Now, it's the same problem is if you use one of them, one is ProtonMail, so it's ProtonMail.com, and the other is Tutanota, T-U-T-A-N-O-T-A -T -A -T -A dot D-E, what? ProtonMail.com and Tutanota, T-U-T-A-N-O-T-A. -T -A. Uh, ProtonMail is based in Switzerland, Tutanota is based in Germany, and they both provide end-to-end -end encryption, which means that what I send is encrypted when it leaves my computer and it arrives at the other person's computer and provided there on Proton Mail or Tutanota, they can decrypt it and nobody in between can get the content. Uh, there are two downsides uh, of this, and, yeah. <laughs> and Proton Mail is actually nicer, has a nicer interface than Gmail, so you're not sacrificing the quality of the interface by using one of these. But you just have to persuade your friends <laughs> to also sign up when they're free. Um, or at least friends who you want to communicate with in, in a secure yeah. manner, right? Yeah. Um, and so there's none of the complexity of, of PGP. It's just really simple. Mm -hmm. So uh, you want to just like a Yahoo.com? Yeah, exactly. And as long as the person you're sending to has, the, has Pro, is on Proton Mail, you're just back and forth. It's seamless. The two catches are you have to use, a, you have to use two passwords, one to get into Proton Mail, and then one to decrypt your mailbox. So when you enter it, you enter two passwords. The second one is if you ever lose your password, you're out of luck. Because precisely what protects you is that Proton Mail doesn't have access to your password or any of your content when it's on their server, it's encrypted, so even if the NSA cracks their server, they can't make sense of what's there. So the most nice thing is we got your password. Yeah, yeah there's, there's they no they password have reset password. button on I mean, that one. For them to help you with your password, they've got to have it, yeah. right? So make sure you don't lose that password and you lose everything. Yeah, so the services like that are great because they're much more user friendly. The challenge is you need to make sure that everyone is using the same service. So the difference with PGP is I can email someone on a Ryerson email address, someone on Gmail address, someone at their work account, uh, and they will work across all platforms as long as everyone has this one extra piece plugged in. So that's the difference. So Yeah. 
you type in a password. That's how it works. Is I have to make sure that I have your key so I know what the secret way to encrypt it is to you. And then it says, I'm going to send you an encrypted email. And it says, OK, type in your password. Make sure it's you. And I said, and then it sends it to you. You get it. It says, you got an encrypted email from Laura. Type in your password to read it. And you type it in and send it back. Where things like ProtonMail are really helpful is if you're a, a union executive <laughs> or a small group and you want Coming to communicate with each other. Perhaps. So you just get <laughs> all 10 people in your yeah. group to all sign up for Proton Mail, and then all of your email amongst yourselves is completely secure. Yeah? The thing I find very frustrating, frustrating about the politics of all this, Proton Mail is great, but it took me two to three months to get on there because the demand is so high. That's right. And so many people want to use this. I mean, they can only let so many people on the server like, to get accounts at a certain time. You can get Start Mail as well, but you've got to pay for that. It's encrypted as PGP built right into, your, into the client. But here again, you pay for that. Right. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, Proton Mail was so popular. It was developed by the scientists who were developing the uh, nuclear, uh, the collider in, in CERN, Switzerland, uh, the CERN collider. Um, and they wanted a secure way, and so they developed their own. But it was so popular that they didn't have the server capacity, so they kept having to add. The, so you had to, I don't know if it's still the case when I did it, signed up. You had to send them a note saying you wanted to sign up, and as soon as they had sufficient server capacity to add, they'd let you know. Now they keep building it, but it's wildly popular because it's so easy to use and it pr provides protection. That's a great segue because it's not all up to us. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Which mail client doesn't, doesn't um, it, or protects your password the best? I don't have the answer to that, and I can try and Does find it. Does Outlook do you? that reasonably well? Um, I don't have the answer to that question. I would be speaking out of turn by trying to answer that. So I don't want to give you false information. But if you remind me, I'll try and check afterwards but so I'll, I can try and get back to you. I mean, by definition, isn't it true that Outlook or any of the others knows your password and it's accessible uh, to them? Because otherwise, how could they help you, you find it? otherwise have to enter it every time you want it to communicate with the server. But yes. what I'm saying so is yes. if you lose it, they can help you get it back. Um, like we're talking about you were password. talking about email providers versus mail clients, which are two. Oh, you're talking about mail clients. Things. I'm sorry. Okay. So sorry. it's stored on your computer. Yeah. I mean, if we're getting really big picture, like anything can be hacked. But yeah, I mean, when it's on your computer, it can definitely be accessed. Um, saving passwords in browsers, those kinds of things, are all ways that make you more vulnerable. So the less that you have those things saved in all of the different platforms, the better. Um, whether Outlook versus Thunderbird, I, I don't have the answer to that part for you, though. Sorry. OK, I want to make sure we have time to actually try and, and put some of these things to use. But I, I do want to end on the point that like, this can start to seem overwhelming when you look at all the different pieces of the puzzle and all of the different ways that we're putting information out there and all of the ways that we can have our information picked up by governments and companies and all of those things. So yes, there are ways we can take this into our own hands. Yes, we can take some of that power back and actually try and control how much we're putting out there, what we're putting out there. Uh, but I do want to emphasize that it's really on us to actually demand other people do better for us. Um, these are three open media campaigns that we're working on. Uh, there's lots of other things you can do. Bill C-51 is what I would say the biggest threat we have to our digital privacy right now in Canada. Um, we have seen promises from the Trudeau government that when they came into office they would reform it. Uh, we have not seen anything on that yet. We have heard they are going to provide better oversight so that we can trust them more with our data and how they're handling that. We haven't seen that happen yet either, and I also don't inherently trust them. Um, we have an action right now at killc51.ca where you can email your MP directly uh, to tell them that this is something that matters to you. You can edit the content of the email, so if you want to email your MP about anything else, also feel free to use it, and you're welcome to send them any other messages you'd like to include along the way as well. Uh, but we really think that if we speak up and make sure that the MPs that are in power right now know that this is an issue that hasn't gone away since the election. It's a really great way for us to make sure that uh, this has changed. Because when the uh, consultations and when the actual reform for Bill C-51 comes up, this is sort of the one chance I think we're going to have to make sure we get this right. So we want to make sure that our digital privacy is really at the forefront of that conversation. Uh, talking about Netflix, we have another campaign we're running, My Netflix, My Privacy. Uh, Netflix has started cracking down on people using VPNs. And as I mentioned, a lot of people are using them to get around geo-blocking. So they're trying to access American Netflix from Canada. Uh, they're trying to access, access Spanish Netflix from France, anywhere around the world. Um, the problem with the way that Netflix is cracking down on it is that VPNs are a legitimate privacy tool. 
And there are other ways that Netflix could keep people from only accessing the content in their own country than cracking down on actual tools that people need to protect themselves. Uh, so this is a campaign that we're running to try and help uh, Netflix understand that just because it's getting pressure from the media content owners uh, to actually crack down on geo-blocking, that this isn't the way to do it. So that's one thing. Uh, and the last one, if you are interested in protecting your privacy in general. Uh, we have a coalition of people. We have over 40,000 people that have spoken up. We have uh, about 150 different uh, experts and organizations and academics that are part of a coalition to protect our privacy in Canada. So those are three websites you guys can check out if you want to find ways to actually help uh, make some noise and make sure that other people are uh, working to protect our privacy online and it's not all on us. So for more information, here are ways that you can contact us and me. Um, Sign up for the email list for the Center for Free Expression. Jim will provide you only with great events and information, I promise. Uh, as the Advisory Council, I'm allowed to say that, right? Yes, I can you are. Okay, great. Um, Is the list going around? Has it gone around? Has it, yeah, we're still. Has it we're made its way around over here? No, I think it's We'll make sure it gets to around. everyone. That's great. Uh, and lastly, we can actually try some of these things out. So um, here's the Wi Fi if you guys want to log on, if you don't already have access or you don't have data on your phone. Don't worry, they'll all be up here when you can flip through them. Um, and if there's anything in particular that you guys want to try out, uh, a bunch of different tools, I have pretty much all of these installed on my computer and my phone, and I'm happy to help anyone else try and install them on theirs, and I want to make sure that you get a chance to try some of them out before you go. Any other questions? Yeah. I was just wondering maybe we could uh, get some information about TTP in relation to, you know, our global situation with this? Do you uh, know we can definitely talk about the TPP, but maybe we'll talk about that afterwards while everyone else is yeah, installing it, because that's a bigger subject, issue. <laughs> that is a huge subject. A the TPP is a, hu it's a huge threat uh, to free expression, to privacy. Is, I think TPP all of those is a things. much huger issue that affects us in a bigger way with all this copyright issue, all this stuff. There, there's a ton of provisions in the TPP, particularly for free expression Especially and, and like information. Especially like the net neutrality now. Yeah, that people are so about there's that. a lot yeah, of but problems let's, um, That's a bigger issue than yeah, we can do with Yeah, but I think it. for so now, why don't we just So we're talking about the trans-Pacific get... partnership, which is a free trade agreement, much more than a free trade agreement, a free trade agreement that Canada is in the process of negotiating uh, and agreeing to with the United States and most of the Pacific Rim countries, which would fundamentally take away, it's really about taking powers away from governments and giving them to corporations. Yep. Uh, and Open Media has a lot going on against the TPP as well, so I would recommend you check us out for that one if that's your idea. <laughs> Um, okay, this is the Wi-Fi if anyone needs it. Um, and then on the next slide, I have a few websites that have, uh, if and when everyone's ready, um, two websites that actually have step-by-step -step instructions that might be of use to you as well for installing a bunch of these tools. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to stick around. If you guys have questions, let me know. And so do you want people to sign, who would like to, to go on to these now? Yeah, if, if, whatever you guys want to try and set up, I'm happy to help you out and we can walk through them. So why don't, so in terms of the formal presentation, this so is... We will conclude the formal presentation. Okay. So are there any other questions that anyone has for Laura or comments or other things they wanted to bring up in relation to protecting your privacy in the digital world? How I do I like see it. the cloud? I, I personally don't like that it. That question is as big as the cloud. Like that. <laughs> I don't like it. Um, you don't like it. There's, there's a lot of value to it. I mean, I, but everything's going into the cloud. I can see why. Yeah. You know, it's obvious why. But the thing is, is that when you have your laptop, you have your laptop. That's yeah. your That's your world. You mm -hmm. control that. Once you have a dumb computer, you have a dumb computer. I've used dumb computers. I know what a dumb computer is. Okay. When I started at Sheridan, you know, using computers, mm -hmm. the first computer I used was a dumb computer. Yeah. And we're basically going, we went from dumb computer to smart computer, which is desktop, and then we went, now we're going back to dumb computer. That's the way I see the, that flow. I think that when we're talking... I, I might be wrong, I just, your comment. Well, I think when we're talking about the cloud, there's a ton of value in being able to share and access information. And I see that value. I think the importance to me is being able to do it on my own terms and protect my privacy while I do it. So the ability to, well, there are certain tools we can. Well, that's and what we're talking we about. If stuff's encrypted, there's a variety of ways. I mean, the cloud is simply other people's servers. Yeah, and it's uh, a matter and that's of all where the, you the cloud is a mystified way of saying your data is on somebody else's server. Yeah, and I, I, I do, yeah. And I do believe that there's a lot of uh, good that can come from 
a lot of the technologies that we're putting to use and the way that we can share information and collaborate. And I, I really do see a positive vision for all of that. Um, I think what I really like to focus on, particularly with the stuff we're talking about today, is ways that I can try and do as much of that as possible on my own terms. And some of that is putting pressure on governments and companies to be accountable. And some of that is me taking that into my own hands. And I think that when we have to look forward to what we want the internet to look like, uh, we really have to have that vision of what we think that should be and how we want to shape that between here and where we're headed. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of problems with it, but I also think that you know if, if we help shape that into what we want it to be, there's some good that can come from that as well. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering how you feel about, because I've been watching like security kind of technology evolving as yep. well and like the CAPTCHA and all these kinds of new things that are breaking out. Well, that's old, but um, moving forward, I wonder how you feel about the kind of like more holistic security technologies that are coming out where they're measuring like your face, your fingerprint, your eye, your like your gait, your body temperature. Like, yep your gestures, all yep. those sorts of things. Like, do you feel like that's a step forward where uh, we're, we're kind of getting into like minority report? <laughs> we have to like get eye transplants if we wanted to do major hacking. It's funny how we used to think of things as 1984 and right. now we're like past that. We're like, no, that happened. Now we're minority report. We're getting way past that. <laughs> um, I think there are risks to it. I think there are risks to biometrics in the same way there are risks to passwords. There are risks to usernames and emails and all of those things. And I think they, they seem escalated or more grave because it's my body and I don't know how to change my body to avoid those things. But I also think the threat is not in that technology existing. The threat is in who controls that information and how they use it and who they share it with. So my fingerprint on my iPhone, you know, I think within a day of it coming out is that like new security model where you can do it. It's like dads fell asleep, kids are swiping their dad's finger against the phone and hacking into it. And, it's like, how secure was that? I don't know. So there are all kinds of ways that they can be used for good or for bad. I think it does give me that sense of peace in some ways where if I want to protect myself, I also know that I'm the only one that has my eyes, my gait, my, my body. Um, and there are some real security things that can come from that. But again, it's so who has that information? Who stores that information? How do they use it? Who are they sharing it with? Th those pieces. And I think there's a lot of questions we have to ask just about how we, how we want it to look and how we want it to work. Um, and I, I think that it's easy to jump to the conclusions they're all going to have these really terrible negative effects and we have to work with the understanding those are possible to prevent those from happening. Uh, but I don't inherently think that they're evil or, or bad per se. Let me start. Sorry, that was a long answer, but. No, that's good, thanks. Any other questions? Did you have a question? Did you have a question? Oh, no, oh, that's okay. So I want to thank uh, again Laura very much for for doing this. I hope you'll join me in thanking her. And uh, if you want some practical help uh, on using any of these, if you want to stay around, Laura will be happy to do that. And she's a master at uh, doing these things. <laughs> I can I can testify she it. can if she can help me install PGP and use it easily. I can help you. She can help anybody. So. <laughs> So again, thank you very much, Thanks. Laura, for doing this.